Hi everyone and good evening and welcome to the Constellation crew. We're going to be exploring the Constellation Cancer the Crab this evening. Uh, but before we do, we have this exciting new image of a black hole to explore with the crew tonight. Um, so let's go ahead and jump right in. Crew, remember seeing an image kind of like this a couple years back? looked almost just like that. Yeah, looked, yeah, yeah. almost exactly. Almost <laughs> a little exactly. fuzzier, but yeah. Yeah, almost a, a little fuzzier. Okay, so let's let's see that one that was released about two years ago. Um, so this is a newer image of this image right here. So this is a real picture of M87's black hole. M87, what is that, crew? I believe it's a uh, supermassive black hole at the center of the galaxy M87. It It is a galaxy. Just M87 is a galaxy. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And then the black hole is that supermassive black hole at the center of it. Um, but this is M87 compared to our solar system. Uh, so you can see the sun at the very center here. And then here is this circle that's representing the orbit of Pluto out in what we call the Kuiper belt of our solar system. And then Voyager 1, a space probe that was sent out many, many years ago and has reached this distance from the sun. All right, so of course, Voyager 1 is nowhere near this black hole in this galaxy M87, but um, you can kind of get a sense of scale. Like black holes are huge and they're really massive. They have so much gravity that nothing can escape them, not even light. However, there is some material that can get pulled around the black hole due to that gravity and get swirled around it so fast that it emits light. And we can see the light that it emits um, using really good telescopes from here on Earth. Really, really good telescopes. Actually, eight of them located all around our Earth that basically create a telescope as big as the Earth to get a picture like this. Because this galaxy, this black hole, is really, really far away. Does anyone remember how far away it is? How far away is this black hole in M87? So Melanie and Greg, you were at um, one of our in-person programs last night, and we explored this um, with Ball State students. It was millions of light years away, over 50 million light years away. So really, really far. Um, and remember, a light year is just a distance light travels in one year, about 6 trillion miles, times that by 50 million. Um, it's a really, really large distance. Uh, so to see something like this is quite amazing. Um, see this detail. And this was the only picture of a black hole that we had for a long time until we got this new one here. Uh, Melanie, do you remember um, what you thought when you first saw this one? I thought it was like fake because it looks kind of fake. <laughs> I think it looks fake too. Um, yeah, it looks like an artist's depiction. Yeah, but it's real. Um, yeah. It's the same black hole, but it's looked at a bit different. And so you can see these kind of bands here. It kind of looks like a shrimp almost. Someone uh, actually <laughs> overlaid a shrimp over this. Um, uh... But it's uh, it's a view of this black hole in what is called polarized light, just like how sunglasses will polarize light um, to cut down the brightness and the glare from the sun and other light around um, you when you wear those sunglasses. Scientists can and look, uh, excuse me, scientists can look at objects and use polarized light to cut down the glare and get more information about the object. And so what, what are these maybe representing here? What is this detail showing us? Um, Cause to back up, this is a black hole. The area in the middle is black because it's so, the gravity here is so powerful. Nothing can escape this region, not even light, the fastest thing in our universe. But there is material going around the black hole light that's lit up here that we can see and observe. Um, but why these, gaps in this polarized image of the black hole. Does anyone here know what this so might be? So I, I, I know the answer, but but originally when I walked, when I looked at it, I thought maybe it was um, a picture of some of the, like a, the trails of some of the things that were actually pulled in. Hmm. But I thought it was originally. 
I think at this point, the material being pulled in would be basically like down to the atoms, you know? Yeah. It's it's so powerful, and you got what's a lot of spaghettification happening around here. Um, Big word. Yeah. What scientists call what happens when things get too close to the black hole because it gets stretched out, and when they get stretched out, they end up looking like spaghetti. Um, so they call it spaghettification. Astronomers like to do that. They just call it like it is. <laughs> uh, so what what actually is it, Greg? Uh, so the, the magnetic field lines. Yeah. For the so, black hole. Yeah. yeah, the magnetic field lines. It's representing or giving us information on the magnetic field lines. And the magnetic field lines will um, actually do, um, or excuse me, are really powerful and they will make that material going around the black hole shoot out of that area into space in the form of jets. Uh, so if you zoom, we're going to zoom in here on the galaxy M87 in the sky. So we left kind of Earth. We're just zooming in on this patch. I'm going to pause it here. And this is M87. It's an elliptical galaxy, so really large, made up of trillions of stars. And you can see this little kind of area right here, this bright line. That's a jet that originates from the supermassive black hole in the very center here. And we're going to zoom in and see that a little bit better. And that jet spans for over 5,000 light years from the central region here. And scientists think it's all powered from those magnetic field lines. So is that like perpendicular field. to the black hole, like coming out towards you, sort of? Kind of, yeah. Um, okay. So there's like, it's perpendicular to the accretion disk. Um, okay. So there's the accretion disk and then the magnetic field lines, they think, shoots it out um, perpendicular to that. It reminds me a bit of uh, pulsars and uh, how their magnetic fields kind of can, you know, affect the what effect uh, you know, the photons that they're emitting. So Yeah, um there's similarities uh, I think with that and and perhaps that's another way of helping scientists understand what's going on with these black holes. Um, because uh, again they're just really hard to observe. The one in our solar system is not an active black hole like this one here. That means it's not actively taking in material um, in a way that we would be able to see it, like here. Um, there's no jets or anything like that. Uh, we typically see active black holes, um, what you sometimes hear referred to as active galactic nuclei, um, in galaxies that are farther away. Um, when we look farther away in space, we're looking back into time. Um, when the universe was smaller, because remember the universe is expanding, things at one point were much closer to each other. And when that was, you know, the case, material was closer to each other in general, and material could come into these black holes and really feed them, fuel them, and um, we would see the effects of all of that. So when stuff was closer, you just had more chance for objects to fall into black holes, like this one in M87. All right, so M87 is in another constellation, not the one that we're exploring this evening. Um, M87 is in the constellation of Virgo, the Maiden. But Virgo is one of the constellations of the Zodiac, and we're going to be looking at the Zodiac this evening because the constellation we're exploring is Cancer the Crab, and Cancer the Crab is a part of the Zodiac constellations. Uh, you might have heard about the Zodiac because of horoscopes and all of that good stuff. Um, but scientists, astronomers do actually talk about the Zodiac as well. And there's um, actual astronomical reasons um, why that is. And we're going to explore that today. But first, let's try to figure out how to find Cancer the Crab. And Caleb's going to help us with that one. Um, why don't we do a little bit of a review though, Caleb first? All right. So, um, as we've talked, as we've shown in our previous shows, um, we've, uh, we've, we've covered constellations in the, um, place known as the winter hexagon, um, constellations such as Orion, uh, Monoceros, Gemini, uh, and Canis Major. And we'll be using some of those constellations to help us find, uh, a couple of those constellations to help us find, uh, our um, cancer today. 
Yeah, so, we have, uh, uh, we have uh, Orion here. So Orion's probably the easiest one for people people to find. Uh, this is this guy right after sunset here in Muncie, Indiana. Um, and so Orion's kind of low in the sky in the south, southwest, um, around this time of the year. But to find Cancer, we're going to have to go up a little bit higher in the sky, right? Up to Gemini the Twins, which is up here. All right, Caleb, take it away from here. Um, right. We have these two stars, right? So, yep, we have uh, two stars here, named known as Castor and Pollux. Those two are the, are the brightest stars in Gemini. Um, now you're going to draw a line from, uh, from Castor, through Castor and Pollux. And you're gonna go a little, go a little, go a little uh, down, follow the line down to that bright star right there. That's 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 one of the uh, stars in Cancer the Crab. Yeah, and the size of the dots here, the stars in this simulation, um, are representing the brightness of them. And so these dots are kind of small. That means they're not too bright of stars in the sky. Not like Castor and Pollux up here, a part of Gemini the Twins. Uh, so Cancer is actually kind of hard to find, but if you can find maybe like Orion and look off to find Gemini, you can maybe use Castor and Pollux up here to get to Cancer. Cancer is also by a bright star over by kind of where the moon is this evening called Regulus. And Regulus is a part of a constellation we're going to explore in just a couple weeks, Leo the Lion. Um, so there's a bright star off to the east of Cancer the Crab, and then two bright stars off to the west of Cancer above Orion. It's always easy to use um, or easier um, to find the constellations when you have an app on your phone or a sky map to help you navigate the sky. All right, so uh, Nicolette's putting some great definitions in the chat. So if you um, need a reminder, a refresher of what a constellation is and some of the other terms check out the chat to uh, find all that information and if you have any questions for us during this presentation um, just put them in the chat we'll get them answered there okay so cancer it's a part of the zodiac what's the zodiac why is it special why do astronomers care about it um, well let's switch our view to today um, earlier today about what five hours ago so around noon, and in our simulation here, I brought up all the constellations of the Zodiac. We have Pisces here, we have Aries, Taurus the Bull, Aquarius, and in Pisces, we have this bright object here that of course is the sun. All right, so the sun's here in the sky, it's shining really bright, and because of our atmosphere or the air surrounding our planet, the sky is shining blue. But we can actually get rid of the atmosphere in the simulation so that we can really explore the sky. And when we do, we can see the sun at the same time as the planets, the bright star looking objects here, as well as of course the stars. When we explore the sky, we tend to speed up time so we can show the sky over the course of an evening. And when we speed up time like that, we speed up time by hours, going an hour at a time or really minutes at a time but we're gonna speed up time in a different way. We're gonna speed up time by days and see what the sun does in the sky, what the stars do in the sky over the course of a whole year. All right, so here we go in three, two, one. Oh. Let's try that again. <gasps> we're using different technology here. Okay, so here we go. All right, again, we're speeding up time by days and days and days, and we're watching the sun appear to change its location in the sky and appear in different areas, different constellations. And let's play that again, and Greg, help us understand this a little bit more, what's going on here. Yeah, so the sun, if you notice, takes a very specific path um, along the sky, right? And that's that's caused primarily by the Earth's orbit around the sun. So so this line is really an imaginary line that, that we've put along 
the sun's path, and we have a very specific name for that line. We call it the ecliptic. And the constellations of the zodiac, the 12 constellations, all fall along that line, right? So that's where the zodiac signs come from, those 12 constellations. They, they come from wherever that line um, or whatever constellations fall along that line, the ecliptic, right, um, that that sun follows. And they're, like we said, there are 12 constellations. Um, there are four specific constellations that, that note some changes in seasons. Um, and we've actually already kind of discussed two of those constellations um, in previous constellation crews, which were Taurus and Gemini. Um, and then obviously the third today with, with Cancer. Um, and those are primarily used, you know, the, the Zodiac primarily rears its head, right, when we talk about Western astrology. But because they do fall along that ecliptic, astronomers also use um, the, the, or have use for, for the zodiac signs as well. Yeah. Isn't there a 13th zodiac as well? There's there a, a constellation that actually falls along this, this path to the sun is in another constellation called Ophiuchus. And so you might have heard of Ophiuchus as one of the constellations or the 13th constellation of the zodiac. I did not know that. Learn something new. Yep. Yeah, it sometimes gets brought out into the news every so often, even though it's been a thing for hundreds and hundreds of years. Yep. But people like the the nice even 12 i think with the the number of months in the year yeah um the ecliptic the name comes from the fact that that's the area where you can find eclipses of the sun and the moon so if the sun's always here the moon's near this line too um you can get eclipses of the sun and moon in this region of the sky the ecliptic is also where you'll find the planets in the sky. And um, a lot of objects in our solar system, like asteroids, um, can be found around this area in the sky, too. All right, so we ended the simulation here, um, changing our time of the year so that the sun appears in the constellation of Cancer. And that was the case for a special period where they define something called the Tropic of Cancer. And Caleb, you know more about that. Yes, yeah, so the Tropic of Cancer, if you ever look on a globe, you probably see um, two lines that um, fall, that are parallel to the equator, that are just a little bit above, a little bit below. Those are called the, uh, the Tropics of Cancer and Capricorn. Now, the Tropic of Cancer is the one that's north of the equator. It signifies a, spe a specific um, latitude, particularly 23.5 degrees north. Basically, during that um, during that um, at that latitude, if you stand on that line uh, at the summer solstice, you would see the sun directly overhead at noon. Basically, similar to how um, with uh, the with the equator, if you were to stand there on the equinox, you uh, would you would, you would see you would see the sun over, directly overhead. Yeah, because so, the sun's yeah. not directly overhead in Muncie ever um, here. So here in Muncie, Indiana, where Ball State University is, the sun is never going to be directly over our heads. Um, it only gets so high in the sky, a certain altitude in the sky. But um, at the Tropic of Cancer and the equator and the Tropic of Cap Capricorn, that area in between um, and the areas in between, you can actually get the sun directly overhead. 23 yeah. and a half degrees. That's a number that a lot of astronomers are familiar with. A lot of people are familiar with because what is it? It's the, like, how does, how does that relate to our planet? The tilt of the earth. It is the tilt of the earth. Yeah. The earth is tilted about 23 and a half degrees, um, from, you know, the sun or the plane of our solar system, basically. Um, and that's why that you know, relates to the latitude and where you can see it high in the sky. Uh, one thing we should note is, I think, um, even though it's called the Tropic of Can Cancer, um, and it was called that because this, it was, the sun would be in the, the 
concentration of cancer during that time. Actually, now in the summer solstice, the sun will be in the constellation of Taurus. But because remember the zodiac, the zodiac as we know it um, was developed about 3,000 years ago. So this, due to precession, uh, the, the the position of the sun during like the equinoxes and the solstices was a little different now. So. Yeah, things have shifted a little bit. Yeah, and procession, um, for people who aren't familiar with that term, um, some people explain it as the wobble of our planet. So our Earth, it spins on an axis, but as it spins on its axis, it also can kind of wobble. Some astronomers hate that term, um, the wobble, but it, you know, it kind of makes sense if you think about it. Wobbles like a top. Um, and due to that wobble, you can see the sun appear in different locations in the sky throughout the year too um or things just kind of shift in the sky i should say all right so there's um more of this constellation than it just being a part of the zodiac and being something you can observe in the sky uh, there's a deep sky object and melanie tell us all about that Okay, so if you were to go outside and take a look um, in Cancer, right about in the middle there, you would see maybe if you were lucky, just a fuzzy little smudge. But if we were to kind of fly in and take a closer look, we would see a swarm of stars. And this is the beehive cluster. So we like to think of them as a little swarm of stars. And all of these stars appear to be kind of connected in some way. And that's because they are a star cluster. And a quick review, a star cluster is really just a group of stars that are bound together by gravity. And this specific cluster is an open cluster, meaning it's a little bit more loosely bound. It has fewer stars than what we call globular clusters. So this specific one is an open cluster of about a thousand stars. So that's, you know, still not few stars. That's still pretty significant. Um, but the diameter of this in the night sky is about the width of three full moons. But of course, it's still not especially bright just because space is so large. Um, so you think, you know, there's a thousand stars in this one little area of the sky, but, you know, they're still extremely, extremely far away. So they're not going to appear um, as they do in this image here. But there was something special occurring there. In 2012, Kepler actually discovered two planets that we found orbiting uh, stars in this clock, or open cluster. And these planets are what we call exoplanets. So really just any planet orbiting a star that isn't our sun, so it isn't in our solar system. And both of these planets that they found were what we call hot Jupiters. So scientists know there's many more planets than those just in our solar system. And some of them are similar in makeup to Jupiter, which is what we call a gas giant. So these exoplanets are often found much closer to their stars than Jupiter is to our sun. Um, which heats them up to really, really high temperatures, and therefore we call them hot Jupiters. So they're really just exoplanets that are similar to Jupiter in that they're gas giants, but they're much, much hotter because they're closer to their stars. And it was significant, um, not the planets specifically weren't especially exciting, but it was the first time we had found exoplanets orbiting a sun-like star in an open cluster. It was just one of those firsts. And not only that, but uh, since 2012, we have found at least four more in this one cluster alone. I'm sure there's many, many more, because as we know, we're ex finding new exoplanets all the time, uh, which is a really cool field of study to kind of keep an eye on, because I feel like we're never going to run out of finding more of them. Um, and in ancient times, if they couldn't see this cluster in the night sky, because you know they didn't have light pollution like we have now, they would think of it as kind of a sign that a storm was coming. And I read that and I was thinking like, oh, that's really interesting. And then I was like, who did they ask? Like, did they just like call somebody up? Like, I don't know. I'm like, I mean, that's like a really cool fact, but I'm like, I wonder how they learned that. Like if somebody wrote it down or I don't know. I just think that's cool. I have no idea. Um, I don't some, of, some of the things I, I, I read and um, have learned, I, I, I don't know where people got it from, um, but I, Think it's really interesting um, especially the kind of imaginations that are required to think of these interesting things and and really ultimately i think that kind of thinking can lead to advancements and discovery because 
if you just ignored it, right? If you're just like, oh, it's just a smudge in the sky, like we would never actually get to the point we are now with these beautiful pictures. Um, so I think it's great that they actually knew it was there and, and made mm -hmm. some kind of connection to their daily lives with it, honestly. We, um, when we do our planning meetings for the Constellation crew, we always have a lot of interesting conversations. And one of the conversations we had about the beehive cluster was about getting stung by bees or wasps and um, just the stories uh, behind all of that. So I've only been stung by one bee one time. I was really excited when it happened because it was the first time ever and I was in like my early 20s and I never thought I'd get stung by a bee. And I don't know, I just thought it was exciting for some reason. Um, but some people here have never star. been, <laughs> some people here have never been stung by bees, right? I think Greg, you've only been stung by a wasp, right? Yeah. Yeah, I just got stung by a wasp actually the first time ever last year, so. It's my own fault, I picked it up, but you know. <laughs> you thought it was dead, so. I did, yeah, my cats were playing with it, so I thought it was dead, <laughs> and it wasn't, absolutely. It's better it's you not. than them, right? I guess, yeah. All right, we're gonna wrap things up with the uh, mythology and stories about cancer. Um, the crab. Why is it called cancer? Caleb, did you uh, learn about that in the first place? Um, I mean, I'm not sure about the origin of the name cancer, but I found out a bit about its, the story behind the story about uh, the story about the mythology. So, um, cancer appears, you know, actually is related to our la to I think last week's constellation of Hydra, because um, it's actually um, when uh, we, as we remember from last week. Uh, um, how the Hydra was killed by the hero Hercules, and uh, during, when he was fighting the Hydra, uh, Hera, who was the wife of Zeus, and for pretty much trying to kill Hercules all his life because he was Zeus's illegitimate child, uh, she sent the crab to basically kill him while he was fighting the Hydra. So he basically had to fight two monsters at the same time. So after he was done killing the Hydra, he basically smashed the, the crab, and Hera to basically honor the crabs, I guess, obedience and sacrifice, basically put it up at the stars. So. Okay, but how big was this crab and okay, how did okay, it compare? I don't, think I crab. <laughs> I, don't really, I don't really say exactly how big. I mean, what was special it was... about it? Like, why this crab? Because Hydra was like, what, like an eight, nine headed snake beast? And then you have a crab. Yep. Like, I just don't, I don't get well, it. got some pictures. Not every, not, every, not every monster is going to be like, you know, you know, some imaginative beast. I mean, if you look at another beast that Hercules killed, uh, 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 one called the, uh, the Nemean lion. I mean, he, you know, it was, it was just a lion. Or if you look at um, another uh, beast that he encountered, he actually had to clean up the stables of, uh, of, uh, of flesh eating horses. So, I mean, hmm. Maybe it was just supposed to pinch him and distract him for a minute. Yeah, maybe it's a exactly. speed thing. Just, get him. just you know, make him make him stumble. Then the hydra. He wasn't wearing green. It was St. Patrick's Day. Don't <laughs> fall. Yeah. Uh, yeah, maybe it's like a speed thing. Like, um, you know, when you're playing fighting games, you can get like a really slow, muscular person, or you can get a, a fast and speedy person. Well, imagine imagine if you had if you got you know, pinched by a crab, that's got to hurt a lot. It's the last thing you need when you're fighting a, a snake with multiple heads, I suppose. <laughs> that little I mean, distraction. Fair. <laughs> I mean, is, there, is there ever, everyone, ever, everyone ever been pinched by a crab? I mean, that, that might hurt. I mean, probably as much as getting stung by a bee. So. I've never been pinched by a crab. I don't think I've even had the opportunity to. Like bees, I've been around a lot of bees, but I've never been around a lot of crabs. <laughs> I feel like that would be scarier than bees, honestly. I mean, like a lot of crabs. Like when you buy, like when you buy like, live crabs at the at the at the to, to, to cook. I mean, usually they have like their their pincers, you know, tied together, tied right? Together, yeah. So, hey man, they are the they are the uh, spiders of the sea, right? <laughs> Eat <hate> spiders. <laughs> well, think about that next time you look at a crab. You know, crab, I'm, I'm okay with the crab. I mean, I just can't eat them. <laughs> what are these um, kind of circles in this drawing? This drawing comes from the 1800s. Um, 
we usually end with one of the drawings from the 1800s in this set and I don't know why they have I don't want I don't know I wonder what these are maybe they could see more stars you know when they were went after the old telescopes they could see more than just the major stars in the constellation well there's a lot of stars here that are not in our little sky map here um, so going back to our sky map, just to wrap it up here, how to find Cancer, it's in between the two stars that make up the heads of the twins, of uh, uh, the constellation of the twins, the uh, Gemini, excuse me. Um, so we have Castor and Pollux, and these are a part of Gemini. And then down here we have Regulus, which we're going to explore more next week because it's in, not next week, but the week after next week, um, because it's in the constellation of Leo the Lion. Okay, so we have Regulus, and we have Castor and Pollux. In between those bright stars is a faint constellation, Cancer the Crab. And in the drawing here, we have lots of stars, though. Like, way more than the one, two, three, four, five stars in the sky map here. But, you know, if you know where to look, you can still find maybe one bright star, and that's all you really need um, to help you find the beehive cluster. And, Melanie, you can't see this during, um, or you can't really see it with your eyes well, but you can see it with binoculars, right? Yeah, binoculars and low-power telescopes. That looks really good. Okay. All right, well, check it out. Um, and we're not going to be doing a live program next week on April 2nd. Uh, we're going to be coming back on April 9th. So check us out in a couple weeks while we explore Leo the Lion. But thanks so much, everyone, and have a great weekend. Take care.